Okay, so welcome back to Pharmacokinetics. We're going to continue where we left off last time. Uh, we had just finished talking about uh, different routes of administration. We're now going to talk about drug distribution and how drugs are distributed throughout the body. Uh, of course, some administration methods, drugs go straight into the bloodstream. Others, of course, require uh, different absorption rates. But once it is absorbed into the, into the bloodstream, a drug is then distributed via circulating blood. A uh, drug will have an effect once it reaches what we call its site of action. And this means wherever it's going to uh, interact with uh, receptors in the body, particularly in the brain we're going to talk about. But some drugs we talk about will have other effects uh, in other parts of the body. But primarily we're talking about the site of action being somewhere uh, in the brain. And so that uh, site of action is where that is occurring. So those receptors are those that will actually allow that drug to have an effect. And we'll talk more about what that means uh, later on. So most of an administered drug will actually be elsewhere. So obviously, if a drug is distributed into the bloodstream, it's going to go everywhere blood goes. Um, so our primary site of action is where we want the drug to go. But the drug's going to be other places too, and that's what results in different side effects. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. You know, we might have uh, an antibiotic, which we're trying to reach uh, to an infected uh, cut in your foot, but it's also going to go other places, and it might make you nauseous or dizzy or all sorts of other things. And so those side effects are the result of the drug being distributed to places where we really don't want it, but there's nothing that can be done about that. Um, so for a drug to be absorbed, um, the drug must pass through capillary walls in order for it to have an effect past the uh, bloodstream. It has to go out through the capillary walls. And so it's going to actually have to transport across uh, those uh, walls within the capillaries, which are those small blood vessels. So there are a variety of things that are going to um, affect this. The capillary wall itself consists of a single, single, uh, a single layer of cells. Um, there are obviously holes or pores between these cells that allow uh, certain things to pass back and forth, oxygen, uh, hemoglobin, things, uh, different substances uh, that cells outside the bloodstream need. So nutrient, nutrients, uh, waste, and drugs move through those pores in different directions, obviously depending on uh, which direction things are going. Waste goes one direction, nutrients go the other. Uh, and drugs are going to go in both directions. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, red blood cells and large protein molecules are, are too big to fit through those pores, but injected drugs, drugs will move through the capillaries and blood by diffusion. So they're going to diffuse out into different tissues. And so this is going to affect a variety of things. Um, peripheral sites uh, can also affect um, how long the drug takes to come back out of those tissues. So um, we talk about marijuana later in the term. You'll see that that THC gets out of the blood and tends to stay places. Um, and in fact, it's one of the reasons why um, urinalysis for marijuana to test whether or not someone's used marijuana uh, is so effective is because it just ends up everywhere in the body. So it's something to, to keep in mind. And we'll, we'll visit that more uh, later in the semester. So, um, drugs are distributed, of course, through the blood. Um, drug molecules can be found in different places in the blood. Uh, plasma uh, is obviously a part of a blood product. This is where water-soluble drugs are likely to end up. Um, the platelets, which are responsible for blood clotting, are more likely to end up um, uh, with lipid-soluble drugs involved. And sometimes they can be attached to proteins like albumin, uh, which will uh, make it what we call a bound drug. So for example, testosterone, a very important hormone, has both a bound and a free version. And they have different uh, effects depending on whether it's the bound or the free version. And so we'll talk more about that uh, when we get to those kinds of drugs later in the semester. And we talked previously about what's called first pass metabolism. And what first pass metabolism refers to is before a blood gets to the rest of the body from the gastrointestinal tract, it passes through the liver. So it's actually metabolized once. And oftentimes it's metabolized into an active form uh, that then allows the drug to actually function. So the liver is the major organ that breaks down almost every drug that we take, um, which is one of the reasons why the liver is so important and why drug abuse 
can be so bad for the liver. And it's something we'll talk about more later in the semester. So um, everything goes through some sort of first pass metabolism and a certain amount of the drug uh, might be completely inactivated or metabolized as it goes through the liver or the drug might be changed into something else in order for it to be effective. So this first pass metabolism uh, is an important part of understanding how drugs get uh, from the GI tract actually into the bloodstream itself. Uh, other routes, of course, might not be subjected to this first pass effect. So if we're going to intravenously um, administer a drug, it's going to get into the bloodstream and it'll go through the liver eventually, but uh, it's going to take it a while to get there. And so rather than administering a drug like um, hydrocodone, which has to be metabolized into something else in order for it to be effective, we would never administer that intravenously. We would then instead administer something else like um, morphine or fentanyl or something along those lines, which is directly effective. It doesn't have to be metabolized. <clears throat> so a certain amount of the drug is going to be inact inactivated or metabolized. Um, these other routes might not be subject subjected to this first pass effect. Uh, one particular enzyme I want you to understand and will certainly uh, come up in exams is an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. And this particular enzyme is responsible for breaking down alcohol in the GI tract. So before alcohol is even absorbed, it starts to get metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase. It's important to understand that men and women have different levels of this particular enzyme, and in fact, women have substantially lower levels of this enzyme. This is the reason why alcohol dosage effects are so different in men and women. It has some to do with the size of males and females, men tend to be larger than women uh, in terms of body mass. But it's also important to understand that men will break down more alcohol in their GI system than women will. And so as a result, one drink has a much larger effect in women than it does in men. And of course, there are individual differences uh, across uh, people, but it's important to understand that's one of the reasons why there is such a significant difference in how much alcohol men and women can consume. Another important uh, enzyme we're going to talk about is called cytochrome P450. And well, the cytochrome P families of enzymes are incredibly important for different types of drug metabolism. And there is this very weird um, problem with grapefruit, and grapefruit juice especially, blocks this particular enzyme and can cause increased absorption of some drugs and can actually block activation of other drugs, can actually dramatically increase the effect of certain psychoactive medications. So it's important to uh, read any labels for drugs and particularly any prescription drugs. If it says do not consume grapefruit of any kind, you want to make sure you follow that because it really does dramatically alter the effects of drugs. A drug like Ativan taken in conjunction with grapefruit juice will more than double its potency, which can be very dangerous. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, Bucifrone, which is a drug we'll talk about later in the semester, uh, is one of those that is dramatically affected by the presence of grapefruit juice. You can see in this figure, we have uh, the open circles are plasma concentrations of bucipirone, or buspirone, sorry, um, after a single dose. Um, the solid circles you see here are uh, following seven ounces of grapefruit juice. Um, three times a day for two days, and then on day three, they're given the, the abuse Um Sorry, it's misspelled up here. I just noticed that. Um, but what you can see is it results in a three to four time fold increase in the amount of uh, bioavailable drug. And so you want to be very careful with uh, taking drugs in conjunction with grapefruit juice. Um, so that's a little bit about enzymes. We'll get into more about those uh, when we start talking more about uh, liver metabolism. There are uh, several different membranes that will affect how drugs get distributed throughout the body. Uh, cellular membranes are sort of the uh, omnipresent portion of this defense mechanism or, or things that cause uh, drugs to get distributed in various ways. The capillary walls we've talked just a little bit about is another barrier. We'll talk about the blood-brain barrier and then the placental barrier between the uh, a mother and her uh, unborn child. 
We'll start with cell membranes because uh, the following three membranes are affected by cell membranes. Um, these are made of a phospholipid layer. You should all remember back to biology. Uh, the outside of a cell uh, is covered in a membrane, and it's usually a phospholipid layer. Um, the membrane is only permeable to small lipid-soluble molecules, so only certain things will get in. What we're going to see uh, later in the semester is most psychoactive drugs don't actually enter a cell, but they interact with the receptor on the surface of the cell, and that's a really important thing to understand. Uh, so some things enter the cell, other things do not, and so that's important for us to keep in mind. So this is important as barriers to absorption and distribution of drugs uh, into cells, and obviously if cells are tightly packed, they're not going to get past those cells. Capillaries, which are of course very small uh, blood vessels, provide uh, another uh, barrier or uh, route for drugs to either get distributed or not. Uh, they have tiny cylindrical blood vessels, which have very small pores between 90 and 150 angstroms, um, which is large enough for most drugs to pass through. This allows drugs uh, to transport across capillary boundaries, regardless of whether or not they're lipid soluble. Um, so the capillary bodies, while they are um, an important part of this process, they don't stop most drugs from being distributed. The blood-brain barrier is, however, a pretty significant um, barrier to most substances. So the brain protects itself uh, from various toxins, and that's a really important part of how the brain actually is, functions and keeps itself healthy. Um, but the brain also has need for things like nutrients and oxygen, has high blood flow, the brain uses a lot of blood, a lot of oxygen, a lot of glucose, um, and so because so much blood is passing through, through the brain, it increases the risk of toxic danger. So the blood-brain barrier is a solution to keep some toxins from getting into the brain itself. Um, the capillaries in the brain don't allow drugs to pass as le easily as capillaries in the rest of the body. And so while a substance that might make it into peripheral tissues throughout the body might not necessarily make it into the brain. So psychoactive drugs have to make it past the blood-brain barrier. And so that's going to alter the kinds of drugs that might have an effect uh, on the brain. So it's an important consideration for any psychoactive drug is will it uh, get past the blood-brain barrier. And the placental barrier, unfortunately, is not as effective. Um, drugs cross primarily by de passive diffusion, um, and it's not a particularly a good barrier to drugs. The fetus is at least partially exposed to essentially all drugs taken by the mother, so it's very important to try to limit anything that might be what we call a teratogen, and we're going to talk more about teratogens uh, in the coming weeks. So, the placental barrier, not a good barrier to most drugs. Blood-brain barrier can be, but psychoactive drugs will get past that. Okay, so that's again a very quick uh, and brief introduction to understanding drug distribution. Uh, for our next topic, we're going to talk about how uh, drugs are terminated, in particular how the liver handles drugs, and talk about what's called uh, elimination half-life, a very important uh, part of understanding how drugs work. All right, and we'll see you next time.